Hey, this is Pastor Aaron Pino. I'm the lead pastor of Overflow Church, and I just want to say thank you for listening to our podcast. It's my prayer that this message encourages you, builds your faith, and helps develop you in the spiritual maturity. Enjoy the message. Um, I'm going to share a word with you, as I, I always love to do. And, you know, just yesterday, I was we were in California celebrating my friend's 60th birthday a few days ago. And I was talking to my friend about, um, we were talking about, you know, when you go through seasons in your life and, you know, you, you're all, it's all fun and everything when you're having a party, um, you know, celebrating a birthday or anniversary or whatever you're celebrating. But, you know, 60 years is a lot to think about. And we were talking about how in the seasons of blessings, you also have to be aware of how much the Lord has brought you through uh, in all the different seasons of life. Amen. So being in a season of blessing is awesome, but you also have to think about all the great things that the Lord has done, even through the season of, of pain or loss or whatever. All that makes you who you are, right? Amen. And so um, I was sharing with her and I just had this in my spirit this morning. I love to talk about um, Naomi and Ruth and that whole, uh, you know, season of really transition that she was in but also recovery as we are still in the era of divine recovery okay so I really was praying into that this morning and I was like Lord there's so many uh, stories in your word where you talk about divine recovery and what that means for people and what that means for us in 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 our days now and in in this book of um of Ruth that many of us are familiar with it and I, I don't know if I've shared you know, any of that here today, but the Lord was giving me like a different uh, perspective into that book. Every time I read the book of Ruth, I get like a different perspective on the story. And so in, I'm not going to read it all because my husband's going to be the one that's preaching, but in the days, I believe that there's a word in this for somebody here, for me, for sure. So if you don't receive it, I receive it. So in the days when the judges ruled Israel, this is in Ruth chapter one, This severe famine comes upon the land, okay? So just right there. I mean, we know that in this time of famine, uh, Elimelech decides to move from Bethlehem in Judah to leave this place that he's known as his home, to leave this land that he's known as his land, to leave his tribe, to leave his people, to live, to leave this place that this is all he's ever known. Okay. And so he leaves this place out of necessity. He leaves this place because he has to. He leaves this place because he in this season of famine. Okay. So the word says that he leaves this place and takes his, all of his people, all of his stuff, his wife, his sons, out of Judah, out of Bethlehem, and they go into this country of Moab, okay, which is a place that's completely foreign to him. But he was in such a place of severe famine that he thought, even though I don't know, even though I don't know where I'm going to, even though I'm going into a place that's foreign to me, even though I'm going into a country where people don't really know what I know, don't, aren't really, you know, in the customs that I'm in or eating the food that I eat, all of that has got to be better than this place of famine. Oh, come on. I know I'm talking to somebody here today. And so... I'm going to stop right there for just a moment because as I was praying about that this morning and that word famine was like really being highlighted to me for some reason. And I started asking the Lord, talk to me about this. And you know what the Lord told me? What is, what does famine represent? And the first thing I thought was like, well, that means when I'm hungry, when I'm really, really, really hungry, that's famine. And I'm not trying to make light of it because I know that there's people that have suffered famine, people that have suffered food insecurity in their life. I know, I know I did. When I was a kid, we were very poor. And so I understand what food insecurity means. Okay. I understand what it means not to know when, when am I going to eat again or what am I going to eat again? You know what I'm saying? And so or do I have to eat ramen again? Do I have to eat another quesadilla for dinner again? Like, Oh, I, I know I'm, maybe I'm just talking to myself. So 
I'm talking to the Lord this morning and I'm like, hunger, extreme hunger. And I said to the Lord, what does that mean? And, and I looked it up and it's like famine is hunger, extreme hunger that causes malnutrition, starvation, and in some cases, death. Okay. And so I'm like, okay, I hear you. And you know what? Like a lot of, in a lot of places, in a lot of countries, it's different decisions. Uh, it cause this thing of famine. And sometimes it's drought, and it's sometimes it's the way we've treated or mistreated the land. And sometimes it's different economic policies or different situations that happen in different nations that cause famine. Okay, so we, we don't know what causes famine in different places, but we know that when it comes to our very specific lives, there's a lot of uh, elements, or there's a lot of things, there's a lot of decisions, there's a lot of situations that can cause different types of famine in our lives. But the key is not to get stuck there in that place of famine and not to get stuck in thinking, I'm so comfortable in my land. I'm so comfortable among my people. I'm so comfortable among my customs or among my traditions or among, you know, all the things and doing all the things that I think I'm supposed to do that I will not be so, you know, pulled out of this place of comfort into a place of, you know, newness, into this place of new things because I am hungry and I want more. And the Lord is challenging us this morning not to get stuck in a place of famine. So don't get stuck in this place of famine. God is going to give you the courage to move beyond this place of lack. God is going to give you the courage to move beyond this place of being hungry for something more. Of being, of having this expectation that something is going to break. That somebody is going to come through for me. The Lord is coming through for you today. Amen. So the Lord is going to deliver you into a new place and into a new situation that is going to bring you to a place of perhaps uncomfortability, but he's going to bring you to a place of shift so that you will shift in your life out of famine, out of lack, and he's going to shift you into this place of promise. And, and you know, my husband, you can come on up. And I know that in the story, as you follow along the story, uh, yeah, come forward because I'll just keep talking. We know that this man... He dies and that his wife, you know, they have the two sons and then eventually the two sons pass. And then, you know, Naomi is in this place of anger and bitterness. And then in this land that was supposed to represent this new thing for us, she recognizes that now it's time to go back to our promised land because now the Lord has shifted something in in, in, in Judah, and now they're back into a place where they're producing. Okay, so then she decides to go back from the place that she came from. And in the, in the Bible, it says that she made this decision, okay, and she had to go back through the same road that she had come from to go back to her place of promise. Okay, so this is really, really important because it says that the Lord led them back through that road. The Lord led Naomi back through that road. And in this road, she came to this place where she was processing all the things that she had lost, that she had lost before, that she had lost during her season in Moab. But the Lord kept leading her and telling her, I'm going to take you to a place of promise. And so even though she was in a place of pain, it says that in, just in this First, Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, it says that she was in a, in a bitter place, that she was in a place of anguish. She was in this place of emotional, um, you know, where she was like questioning what, what's going on, this confusion. But she kept moving forward. And that is the key is that you don't just stop when you feel stuck. You don't just stop when you feel hungry. You don't just stop when you feel this loss, but that you keep seeking and asking the Lord, where are you leading me to? Because you know that the Lord is a God of abundance. He is not just a God of abundance, but a God of overabundance. So today I want to encourage you in this word, and I'm not going to keep going because I, I can, and my husband, you really need to come over here, but the Lord is going to take you to a place of surplus. He's going to take you to a place of abundance and overabundance. So if this word is for you, I want you to stand up and receive it. If you've been in any season of famine, whether, it, and that's not just hunger, it's not just money, it's not, it's, it's, it's vision, it's expectation, it's in this place where perhaps you've seen death of a vision in a particular uh, thing in your life, but God is saying, I'm going to lead you to a place of surplus. I'm going to lead you to a place of richness. The Lord says, I'm going to bring prosperity. 
prosperity upon you and you will know no lack. I'm going to release a blessing over you that it's going to heap over you and you're not going to be able to contain it in your hands. So Father, we thank you, Lord, for the, for the greatness that you're bringing, the multiplication, the supply, the abundance, the overabundance, the multiplication. Lord, thank you that you're going to satisfy their souls, Lord, in this next place or that you're bringing them to a place of luxury. You're bringing them to a place of success, God. You're bringing them greater, greater, greater than they had before. Lord, in this season, Lord, of divine recovery, I just decree and declare right now that you will enter, you will walk in this season of abundance and that divine recovery is coming upon you in every area of your life. So, Father, we thank you right now. Come on, let's thank the Lord. Let's celebrate his goodness. Let's celebrate everything he's doing in us. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God. And we say, yes, Lord, heap it upon us. Heap it upon us. Pour it upon us so that we can pour. We can pour back not only into the kingdom, so that we can pour back into our brothers and sisters. Father, thank you that you're filling us. Uh, you're filling our place so full, God, that we're going to release our abundance into all those that are around us. Come on, don't you want that? That's what happens when you are in a place of not just recovery. When you are in a place of divine recovery, you're going to do that. You're going to be so excited for all that you've recovered, but you're going to get so excited that you're going to start to release your abundance over on everybody. So, Father, we thank you right now. We thank you for this turnaround season, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, we give the Lord one more big shout and a big praise in the house. Come on. All right, you may be seated. It's okay to shout in church and, and, you know, let us make some noise, amen? I mean, because listen, the world, when you're out there partying and doing your thing and having a good, you make some noise, right? The church is living and active, so it should have some noise in it. This isn't the church of the frozen chosen, is it? No, this is overflow. That means there's something flowing up in here. The Holy Spirit flowing up in here. So give the Lord one more praise and one more shout. Come on. See, you got to understand something about sound. There has to be a sound coming from the house of God. Because everybody else is releasing a sound. But the sound that overflow creates is contending for the atmosphere. Who's going to rule in this region? Let me say that again. The sound that you create is contending who's going to rule the atmosphere in this region, in this side of town. Come on. So there must be a sound coming from his people. In other words, the sound that you create even in your own home is contending who's going to rule the atmosphere in your home and outside your home. What you speak is, is, is powerful. It's life or death. In other words, when you get up in the morning, it's hard sometimes to get up in the morning. You know, you got to go to work. you got to do these things. I'm just flowing a little bit till we get to the message, okay? Now, hang on with me. Now, you get up in the morning, you go, man, oh, man, i got to get up there to see all those folks at work. You should get up and say, Lord, you have to anoint me for this day. Oh, you got to, oh, man. And all of a sudden, you go, you get this attitude, a kingdom attitude. Because where I grew up at, if someone looked at you wrong from across the street or somewhere, you, you gave them the look, right? And someone don't have to be from the neighborhood, you just did it anyway. And what happened, you looked over and you said, what you looking at? Or they told you that. In other words, then you would say back, oh, you want some of this? This is the attitude you should have as a kingdom attitude. Oh, I'm going to work and they're going to get some of this. Someone out there is depending on your breakthrough for them to have a breakthrough. That isn't even in my notes. I'm just flowing. I was just cracking myself up here. I was trying to hang on as the presence of God as Marlene was worshiping. I was hanging on, grabbed the Bible. I sat there. And then you got this person sitting right by me, Diana, saying, leans over after I come back. And she goes, I'm called a prophetic intercession. Of course she is. You know how prophetic intercession works? You're interceding, talking to God. God speaks to you. That makes it prophetic. There's no other way. 
God wants to talk to his people so you can release what he's speaking to you. And Norma said something very powerful to, to, to take you back where it all started. God is realigning his people, bringing them right back because he wants to bring things into closure to shoot you into your destiny. Marlene and Kristen, stand up. Marlene and Kristen, stand up. The Spirit of the Lord would say to you this morning, my daughter and my son, you have trusted the process that you have been through. But the Lord is saying, I'm, I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon you and your sons and daughters because you are going to have spiritual sons and daughters in the days to come. You are called to do something for the kingdom of God at a greater level. And you've been hanging in there. You've been patient. And watch and see. God trusts his people first with stewardship, and then you go to rulership. I bless you in this new season you are walking. And it's even about the little ones. The little ones. The future of the church. The future of the kingdom of God. I bless you with the revelation. The apostle Paul said, to me was given an abundance of revelation. I read, Lord, was given the revelation in this new season. I bless you. And your son will prophesy like you've never seen before. I bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you. See, you got to understand something. And then during the worship, Marlene said something very interesting. She said, victory. Once worship starts talking about victory, they've tapped into heaven, releasing the word of the Lord into the atmosphere. Now it's our time to get into it and come in agreement with it. It's just powerful. And then, and then the whole thing, I felt like God was, and then uh, Diana leaned over just a minute. I'll say it again, if you don't mind me sharing what you said. She said, I'm called to prophetic intercession. In other words, victory, and then she says that. God is realigning the front lines with a new, fresh troop of people. It's not, a, it's not that the old ones were not, were not any good. God does realign things. He's realigning the front lines in his hour. Listen to what's going on in Israel. They're under attack. Right? If they're at war, the church of Jesus is at war. We got to be interceding. See? So victory is today. We decree that in Jesus' name. God is calling to people and reorganize them, reshifting them over into the front lines. Your voice needs to be heard. The sound that you carry needs to be released. Even if it's in front of three people, even if it's in front of one person, someone's got to get what God is putting in you to get, get that out of you. I always tell God, put me, give us the most dangerous ones. It's really interesting when you ask God that, and all of a sudden he puts this crazy person, for, and they're just going off and all this stuff, and you're saying, what the happened? Well, you ask God to put the most dangerous one in front of you. And some of us ask, well, God, I just take the light duty stuff. And God said, that's good, because right now I'm going to trust you with them, because I'm going to develop you to do the greater things for him. See, he does things not our way. His ways are not our way. His thoughts are not our, our way. He just does these things. But see, let, let me share this with you. Put the first slide up there. Something has happened. Some of you heard me mention this before. It, it's about the name of Jesus. I'm telling you, something is going on in the atmosphere, and it's been going on for years now, where people do not want to hear about the name of Jesus. They don't want prayer in school. They don't even want you praying in the name of Jesus, but I got something for you. In the name of Jesus, rise and shine, for the glory of the Lord will be seen upon the people. But we have to get up to do this in Jesus' name. So, listen to this. There's a couple of scriptures before we go into the, the sermon there, but I want to release just to you. First one, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. If you can, write that down. Because this is how some of you feel in here as I was praying for you. You, you, said, you were feeling like you're weak and this and that. But God, the Apostle Paul said, my grace is sufficient for you for my prayers is made perfect in weakness. What did the Apostle Paul mean by that? He said, in my weakness, his power is made perfect. When you find yourself weak, guess what happens? You'll find out things, more things about God in your weakness than you do when you're strong. The other scripture is this. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 9. This is how a lot of people feel in America and across the world. But we have this treasure in earthly vessels. You're a vessel, you have treasure in you. 
He says, the excellence of the power may God may, may not be just of us, but of God. And this is what the apostle Paul said there. He goes, we are hard pressed on every side. How many have felt lately you're hard pressed on every side? I mean, you're like, Ugh, what, what happened? And then you're all by yourself and you feel hard pressed on every side. I mean, you're, you're just like, what's going on here? You're hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Hello. You probably felt like you were going to die and all of a sudden you made it through the day and you got home. You weren't crushed. And the other pros is we're perplexed but not despair. Persecuted. How many have feel persecuted lately? I mean, you just don't even have to say nothing. You just show up and you feel all this ugliness. But this is what the apostle Paul, but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Let me tell you what he said there. Not forsaken, unless you're not forgotten. But when he said struck down but not destroyed, hey, you got knocked down but you did not get knocked out. That's what happens. Sometimes we take hits. Oh, geez, what happened? Oh, oh. And then all of a sudden it looks like that. Someone's gang, they're jumping you. A gang is jumping you. It's all over you. Oh, you're all over. The, all this stuff is going on. You got your kids, your in laws, everybody acting all up. And you feel like you're being jumped by everybody. How many have been there before? Husbands are not even raising their hand up. I mean, I felt like that, like I'm under pressure. This is the Apostle Paul. He said, but I'm struck down, but not destroyed. And all of a sudden you get home. He said, man, I'm glad I'm home. And then all of a sudden it starts all over again. And all of a sudden you can't wait to get to bed. You turn on the TV. Even. You tried everything. But guess what? You, weren't, you were knocked down, but you weren't knocked out. That was the Apostle Paul. And here's another one. This is really interesting what the Apostle Paul said. Hey, they were feeling it back then. And back then they didn't have iPhones or iPads. They didn't have the luxury that we had. They didn't. I mean, I'm, they didn't have nothing we had. They didn't even have you could order food. You had to go buy food. You had to cook your own. They, they didn't have an Uber. <laughs> this is the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, 39. Now listen carefully. He says like this. He goes, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we go through trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry? There's a lot of hungry people out there right now. They're looking for something. In a minute, you're going to find out how, how why people are hungry in different ways. Watch this. Threatened or death, as the scripture says, for, sake, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. Do you know that what he's saying there is sometimes you go to work, you went out there, so like it was, they're trying to slaughter you. But you know what? You will overcome it all because who can separate you from the love of Christ? All this thing is what you're in the process of things of you moving forward and moving your family forward. Now watch what the rest of the scripture goes there. No, despite all the, do not despite all these things. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And Apostle Paul said, and I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Amen. Ain't that great? Amen. Now watch what he says there. Nor death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons. Listen, I was ministering deliverance to this guy the other day, and he was, we cast this demon at him. I go, I want, you me to, I want you to do me a favor now, I told the guy. If it comes back, don't feed it. That spirit of lust you had on you, quit watching them sights you're on. That's feeding him. Choke him out. Starve him out. That's a whole other series. Now he goes, or demon, neither our fears for today nor our worries for mañana, tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above earth or below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is Bible. I, I know some people that pull pages out of the Bible. Don't want to read those parts. They wouldn't want that because that's too much. But listen to this. He says, this last part of that verse goes, able to separate from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ Jesus the Lord, we need to know the Lord of our life. Now watch this. This next verse. 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7. There are times where your pastor is not going to be able to get to you. Or your mentor, or your papa, or your mom, 
And the Apostle Paul tells Timothy this. He goes, Therefore I remind you, stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying of my hands. Now watch what he's telling him. Timothy, if you look at the whole context, come to the chapter, he goes, I am in jail. I can't come and stir you up. But by the way, don't worry, don't be crying because I'm in jail because I did something bad. I'm in there because I was doing something good. He goes, but I need you to stir it up. When you're going through these situations like the other verses, guess what? You need to stir it up. You need to fan the flame. Go back like Norman said, go back where it all started and get another chance at this. And he tells him, for God has not given you what? A spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. See, Timothy was running into some Christians, and they were older, and they were trying to turn his fire off, his, his flame. I call those wet, black, wet, wet blanket Christians. They throw a wet blanket on your fire. Don't let them do that. Stay connected to the church. Stay connected to overflow. Bid in overflow mode, and that way, what's on you touches them. See, for, so now watch this. Here's another verse you got to remember. I've told you this so that, you may, that peace will be with you. This is Jesus. In the world, you will have trouble. This is Jesus saying to the folks, hey, get pasa, check this out, guys. Listen, in this sermon, you're going to hear English, Spanish, Spanglish, and I speak in tongues. You might get all four languages in one service. So watch this. He goes, you may have trouble, but, but cheer up. I have overcome the world. It's who you're connected with. That's who you know has overcome the world. And his name is Jesus. So the first slide is up there. Here we go. Everybody say, I'm ready. Put your seatbelt on. Now, you know what? Take it off. Let's put, take the helmet off. Take it, just get ready. We're about to go in deeper. And it's not going to be this big, huge revelation. It's just the word of God, which is profound in this time that we're in. See, the name of Jesus is the most powerful name in the world. How do you know that? No one wants to mention the name of Jesus. I have family members, and we get in a tense discussion. They go, well, don't bring Jesus in this. <laughs> that does not line up. Have you ever said, well, let's talk about what would Jesus say? And they get all offended. Go to, go to work and mention the name Jesus. Oh, don't say Jesus. I was at the gym one time, and this guy started witnessing to me about Jesus. I told him, I'm a pastor, and he gets louder and louder. They turned us in at the front desk that we're a Christian talking about Jesus. I go, amen, we got it. we're getting it right now. We're right where we need to be. I go, let's go get somebody saved and baptize them in the pool in the Las Vegas Athletic Club. Imagine not what would happen then. See, the name of Jesus is the most powerful name. you got to remember that name. See, and the next thing you got to know is that the Holy Spirit is the most powerful spirit out there. Not the spirit of fear or Jezebel. No, the Holy Spirit is the most powerful spirit in the world. And you really want to make people upset up there or make the demonic realm upset? Talk about the blood of Jesus. No one talks about the blood no more. Your mama used to talk about the blood. She taught me everything, a lot of stuff I know. Your mom taught me deliverance, how to minister to people. She goes, never forget the Holy Spirit. Don't forget about the blood and the name of Jesus. She taught me that. Well, she just messed me all up. She had that look. I go, what you looking for, Nina? I see him. She was looking for visitors that were on people. She could see them. I had the great mentor, great teacher. Most powerful teacher I had on the deliverance. And here's another thing. The devil hates when you speak of the name of Jesus. Everybody shout with me, Jesus. Jesus. Now, I want to show you why the name of Jesus is so powerful. Jesus was fasting. Then all of a sudden, he, did, he gets commissioned to do what he's got to do. Now watch what happens. That's, I hope we, yeah, Jesus gives his job description. This is what he tells them. Watch this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Hello. How many know Norma mentioned about being poor and all that? How many know that even the poor people need Jesus? 
And then he goes on to say, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Christian, that means there's people with, that their hearts have been broken. Not only that, they've been wounded. Did you know a wound can become a womb? And if you're not healed completely right in that woundiness, you could birth woundiness, everything that comes out. But Jesus says, Christian, hey, I come to heal those guys. I come to heal everybody that's broken and everybody that's wounded. And to proclaim liberty to the captive. That means there's some people that have visitors on them or in them. Have any of you ever ran into one of those people? Some people said, they're pointing at a person over there. No, okay, here we go. And recovery the sight to the blind. There are many people they can see in the natural, but spiritually they're blind. Even Christians could be blindsided. To set liberty those who are oppressed. How many know our nation needs more of this type of gospel of Jesus Christ? See, Jesus came to get the people out of a dark situation. I believe he still wants to do it today. Next slide. 1 John 3, 8 says, the one, this is probably not written the, on the next slide. But the one who does this, uh, this is, the reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Now watch this. If we can back up. back up, Yeah, that, that's fine right there. I'm sorry. I got my notes all messed up here. Please forgive me. I'm quick to ask for forgiveness. I'm telling you. I know about unforgiveness. <laughs> now watch this. Jesus tells him his job description, right? Then in this slide right here, you see behind me in Luke 4, 20, 21, it says he rolled it up. It was a scroll. He rolled it up, right? And when he rolled it up, he handed it back to the attendant. Then he sat down and all, all the eyes in the synagogue looked him intentionally. And then he began to speak to them. The scripture that you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Look what he said. This is what he's saying. What I just said to you is about to start to happen. In other words, he spoke what he wanted, what he wanted to see. We as people of God need to start speaking what we want to see in Christ Jesus. Not the other way around. We might say something negative and this is keep going. It keeps getting worse and worse. But you need to speak the opposite and say, no, my son and my daughter are coming home to the church in Jesus' name. I'm going to have a breakthrough in Jesus' name. Uh, by this time next month, I'm having a promotion at work. Yes. You have to speak what you want to see. The other voices are speaking louder than God's people. See, Jesus gets busy right away. He just didn't speak it. He demonstrated it. Next slide. Jesus goes and casts out a demon that was sitting in the church. Here's the verse. And when they were astonished at his teaching, he, this is what he did. Now watch this. This is really interesting. i got to slow down. Lord, help me, Holy Spirit. Slow me down, Lord, a little bit. Because I keep wanting to jump way ahead because someone's going to have a breakthrough here. I, I love breakthroughs. But watch what happens here. He was teaching for he, his word with authority. Now in the synagogue, you could put the word there, synagogue right there, put church. There was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. You know what that means, let us alone? That means there was more than one. Now, I'm not making this up. It's in the Bible. What we have, it goes, what have we done to you, Jesus of Nazareth? The name of Jesus. Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Listen to this. This is the most powerful thing today. There are people even sitting in church that have visitors on them. But Jesus Christ came to say, I'm going to deal with you if you're in the house or you outside the house. I'm taking care of business. I've been anointed, and you're going to be anointed to destroy the works of the devil also, which we should be. Now, now watch what happens here. This is the most prophet stuff. What happened? After Jesus said that, right, this is what happened. He kept, they, they got mad inside the, the church, inside the synagogue. 
And what they did to him, they tried to get him out of the church and took him alongside the mountain and tried to throw him off a cliff. Listen, there are people out there that are functioning by something totally different that is not, a, that is not of God that will try to hurt you. And it's okay for you to go, I'm going to do like Jesus did. I'm stepping out of the way. You did what you had to do. It's okay to sneak out out of a situation. They just don't stand there. Jesus did it. So all of a sudden, he sneaks out of a situation, and he goes over to Peter's mother-in-law's house. Next slide there. He stood over her, and he rebuked the fever, and he left her. And immediately, she arose and served them. Jesus was demonstrating what he just spoke in that same chapter. And watch what happens. Men of God, take care of your mother-in-laws. Look what happened. Peter's mother, immediately, she got up, arose, and served them. You take care of the mother-in-law, she's going to serve you. Next slide, please. And then all of a sudden, Jesus goes further down in this chapter. In Luke chapter 4, verse 4, 41. Many were healed after the Sabbath and sunset. We don't have time to unpack this all. But Marina, that day on the Sabbath, you're not supposed to heal people. And all of a sudden, you go, I'm going to let the sun go down just a little bit, and I'm going to get busy on them. And this is what happened. When the sun was setting, all those who had any sick, any that were sick, with various diseases, brought them to him. Look. It didn't say the people came that were sick. The people went and got the people that were sick. We have to be people. Oh, Jesus is at overflow. Let's bring some sick people to get them healed in Jesus' name. And he goes, and, and, and this is really, really interesting. He goes, he, and then goes, and he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out, saying, Are you Christ, the Son of God? In other words, are you Jesus, the Son of God? And he rebuking them, said, don't allow him to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. Jesus had a way of saying, hey, that's enough. Cut it short. Now watch this. Later on in 43, verse 44, Jesus preaches in Galilee, but he said to him, I must preach the kingdom of God. Don't just preach church. Preach the kingdom of God. To the other cities also because to for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the churches, in the synagogues of Galilee. Now, this is the thing. In Mark chapter, this is the three stories I want to run by you real quickly. And we're going to pray for people. Watch what's going to happen. Listen, in Mark 5.25, there's a woman with the issue of blood who has spent lots of money on physicians. How many heard the story? I think that's like America today. You've gone from doctor to doctor, counselor to counselor, friend to friend, bar to bar. Then put it in Spanish, cantina to cantina, club to club. But this woman had an issue. It sounds like America today, a lot of folks are having an issue and God is saying, I want to heal you in this hour. See, she, had to, she spent lots of money. A lot of us have spent a lot of money. There's nothing wrong with doctors. There's nothing wrong with what we need them. But however, if you tried everything, maybe you're supposed to go to the altar and one touch from Jesus, you'll be healed. It's pretty powerful. As well, she shows up. And back in those days, it was a custom. The men... We're the ones who always led the way. But she, could, she, she was not right for a woman to get through things. Something like that. So she forced her way. Who knows what it looked like. And like she was low, high. She was, and then she moved some people and they, get back, you're not supposed to be here. You know what? I mean, who knows what it was like. But she pressed through. And all she did was go, huh, there's this garment. I'll just touch that. And I'll get my healing. And Whoa! She tried and been healed in Jesus' name. And the most powerful thing, Jesus turns around. Who touched me? And it's the most interesting thing. The disciples and the men that were around him said, no one touched you. But Jesus knew someone touched him. And all of a sudden, she goes like this. I get into she was hiding behind these men. And she goes, it's me. It's me. I touched you. The word there is very powerful. Your faith has made you well. 
be healed from your affliction. Jesus encounters, listen, this is all about Jesus, the name of Jesus. Jesus encounters this woman at the well. This is the powerful story. It sounds to me like America again. This woman says something to Jesus. Jesus says, ah, you said correctly. The, the, you've had five husbands. And the one you're with is not. Listen, if you really look at the story, she wasn't a bad woman. She wasn't a bad woman. Listen, men of God, there's many men out there that have gone from woman to woman to woman also. So we can't judge her like that. This is what I'm saying. She was had a, a heart problem. She went from one husband. Oh, the, uh. You will never, if you are heart sick, the only way you can be healed from being heart sick is when you meet your creator. Take me back where it all started, Lord. See, it sounds to me like in America, people go from this place to this place, from this place to this place. And next thing you know, they're not even walking forward. They're walking sideways. They're getting really off alignment with God. And next thing they go to this way, this way. It's just like Samson. I don't know why I keep talking about Samson. But Samson, he went to the club. He went to Delilah's club. He kept going back and back and back and back like he was trying to find something. We cannot find it out there. The only place to find it is Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. I was lost. I used to come home. I used to be on meth. I used to be an alcoholic. I came home. I tried it all out there, all these crazy things. And I was married to Norma. And Norma prayed me back in. And I used to come home and sit at the table. And my heart was sick. I was wild. It was sick. And I used to sit at the table. And all of a sudden, it would come from my mouth. I want to go home. And my kids used to look at me. Dad, you are home. I had to pull myself so far away from God. I was trying to find my way back. And all it was was for me to give my heart back to Jesus. Back to my creator. You can ask Norma. I say it all the time. I drive down the road. She's in the car with me. I want to go home. Wow. <laughs> to this day, I think, whoa. Why did I go so off track? I was looking for love in all the wrong places. My I thought I wasn't running around with other women. You know what I was running? The bottle of beer was my affair. The drugs. I was going here, here, buy drugs there, buy. Just like this woman, think about it. Going from one man to another man to another. I was like, well, if I can't find the drug over here, I'll go to this one over here. If I can't do it, I'll just go to the 7 Eleven and hang out. Someone will come. Some of y'all know I'm talking to you because you've been like just like me. And now you're home, though. Now listen to this. The first woman had an issue. Flow of blood. Through the blood flow. Physical, afflicted. The second one, the heart. Something was going on with her. Now here's a third story. Then Jesus gets in a boat. You know, Jesus got in boats. It's okay to go to the lake and get on a boat go skiing. Jesus got in boats. It's okay. I have a guy that's a chaplain. He goes to the uh, speedboat racing thing, and he goes, and Jesus got into their boat. And goes there and ministers to them. There's hurting people there too. Come on. Now, this is a powerful story. Because look at this. The woman was sick for 12 years. It started somewhere. The woman with the five husbands and the one, the, 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 it started somewhere. Now, here's the man. They came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadarians. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who, had his, who was dwelling among the tombs. He was hanging around the dead. Those kind of things take you where everything's dead. They read the thing and they said, and no one could bind him, not even the chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him. When somebody's fully demonically possessed, they're as strong as nine men. Wow. 
Now watch what happens here. And the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in peace. Neither, neither could anyone tame him. They were trying to tame him. And always at night, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And listen to this. When Jesus saw him from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out in a loud voice and said this. Now, let me say this to you. One translation says that this guy, this man in the tombs that was, had this demon on him and all this, he will howl like a wolf. Oh! But all of a sudden, this boat shows up, and he turns. Instead of howling like a wolf, he said, oh, I'm going over here. Something had a click in him. Even the demons knew who Jesus was. Even the demons know what the name of Jesus. And he said, he cried out in a voice, said, what have do we do with you, Jesus? Son? Jesus again. Son of man, I implore you by God that you do not torment me. They were saying, hey, I implore you by God. They're asking. Listen, if the demonic is saying, hey, the demon, hey, you better carry the name of Jesus with you because they're more worried about the Jesus in you than with anything else that's on you. I believe God is calling his sons and daughters back no matter where they're at. He's saying, come home. Your heart has been sick. Your heart has been hurting. It's that song. Remember that song? Looking for love in all the wrong places. Remember that song? I mean, you, some of you guys probably don't know it because you're not old enough. But then there's another song. I got jokers on my left, clowns on my right, but I'm stuck in the middle with you. <laughs> it's okay to, to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. It's okay to be rededicated again. I get saved every week. I go, Lord, I give you my heart back again every week. Sometimes I just feel like, Lord, I got to get closer. You, I just make sure. I make sure the devil's in trouble by the time I leave my house. He knows I'm coming. And later on in that verse, this goes like this. Then they came to Jesus. Here's the name Jesus again. And they saw the one who had been demon possessed and had a legion sitting and clothed in what? His right Mind. And it says, all of a sudden, they said, and they were afraid. How do you be afraid of someone that's in the right mind? It's because it was profound. They thought he was incurable. But Jesus shows up on the scene. I remember being so lost. And, I, you know, I'm married to Norma. She's praying for me. I came home, and she goes, honey, take off your, let me sit down. Let me feed you. Take off your shoes. That's no, I take care of myself. I was always up to something. She pushed me, and I fell back in my chair on the sofa there. She goes, let me take off your shoes. See, love exposes things. She pushed me back, and I felt I was so drunk. And she grabbed my shoe, and she went like this, and all this money flew out everywhere. I was hiding even money. And I got exposed. I said, I can't hide nothing from her now. Jesus is exposing me. And I used to come home ready to argue because she was always the person to argue when I came in the door. And now she's loving me. And I go, she's up to something. She wants something. I told her my mind was totally messed up from all the meth. I was exaggerating. Making things up. I was in the backyard digging holes, looking for stuff. I didn't even know what I was looking for. I was just making holes in the back. I was tweaking. But God started, I got back involved with Jesus, and he started to restore my mind. I can relate to these three stories. I had an issue. And Norma one time found me OD'd in the bathroom, blood coming out of me from nose from everywhere. Issue of blood. I was putting all that stuff in my blood system. The other one, I was looking for drugs everywhere. Just, I, I, I have to say this again. That, the woman there at the well, she thought she could find it in this man. 
said, it's not working. Let me find another one that has more money. Oh, forget that. Well, this one will be this. Day. Oh, she goes, well, maybe I won't marry them. Maybe I just live with them. But Jesus shows up and doesn't even judge her. He loves her where she's at. And she became one of the most powerful, prophetic, apostolic, evangelist women in the New Testament. If her name is Potina, not Pastor Tina, Potina. And this is what she became. She won her whole family. She won the whole town. And then she went to another city, to another town. And all these people started getting saved. And then they tried to persecute her. And then they tried to kill her. They put in a hot boiling pot of water to burn her alive, boil her alive. And they couldn't do it. She come out of that water like, what? What you guys up to? It's just like a, it's just like a jacuzzi. There's nothing wrong with it. I think that's the first time they thought about making a jacuzzi. It was back in the Bible. Let me tell you what happened last week. I spoke at the Las Vegas Dream Center. And there was this man, Hispanic guy. I looked in his eyes and I could see. He said, I could see he was trying to tell me through his eyes, I want to come home. Even though he was saved, he still wanted to come home. And I kept pointing at him. And I come back over here, then over there. And then I came down off the platform. I stood on a chair and went like this. But then God would bring me right back to him. Because I could relate. I could discern that he's been places. I've been places where he's been in his past. And he's trying to find. He gave his heart that Jesus came home. But he's trying to get the steps to, to walk it all out. Next thing you know, now it's Thursday. He shows up at the prophetic intercession class. Marketplace Mastery. They made a call. Who wants to pray for the Latin nations? He jumps out. It's me. It's me. He had shorts on to here. Ex-gang member. These big old glasses. I mean, wouldn't even look like someone would want to pray. That like, kind of guy would want to pray like that. And Norma, he starts to say something. And Norma goes, let me help you with this. And Norma starts to help him. And when he went to sat down, he said one thing, couple things to me. The first thing he said, now I know where I belong in ministry. We need to preach the Bible. More than ever. We need to mention the name Jesus more than ever. See, I can get you saved, but it's him who saves you. He's the one you need to get home. That word I said, your heart will always be sick until you meet your creator. I heard it from Pastor Joel. And that's what was going on in these stories. The woman was sick. She just needed that touch to be healed. The other one, wandering. Then this man at the, in the tombs. I feel like sometimes I was that man at the tombs. I was hanging around things I shouldn't have been hanging around with. Filling my, my blood system with all this drugs and all that. But I thank God for a praying wife and the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ. I remember this. And we'll close with this. I went to a meeting. After, you know, I'm saved. I got, they asked me to come and speak at this place. The place is a casino. It was in a conference room. And I looked at all those 2,000 people in there. And I said, oh boy, they're going to get some of this. I'm going to mention Jesus. Because there's people in there looking for things. And I get up there and I make this, I say something. They only gave me five minutes, but I'm good. I can make an altar call in three minutes. And I start mentioning about Jesus, what he can do. And I make an altar call. And the biggest, a massive altar call, all these people come forward. Another conference at the Silver Stake. One was at the, uh, at the, uh, uh, the Venetian. The other one was at the, Silver, at the Silverton Hotel Casino there. I made another altar call in there. And that went over 500, under 500 people come forward to receive Christ. In the casino. Come 
I'm telling you, it's time that the body of Christ says, you know what? That's enough, devil. That's enough. Leave my kids alone. Leave my family alone. I have a destiny. That way I'm going with you, that's destruction. And you know what? I'm telling you about your future. You know where you're going, and I know where I'm going. So I'm telling you. Don't go out there and find direction from a psychic or a palm reader. This palm reader said, hey, I want to read your palm. Here in Vegas, I was walking by. Hey, can we read your palm? I'll give you a future. I go, as long as I can talk to you about your future first. And she said, go ahead. I go, one day you're going to stand before your maker. And her eyes got huge. And then you're going to stand there. They're going to let you, he's going to ask you, why should I let you in? She got panicked, started crying. She goes, no one has ever said that. She was like the woman at the well. No one has ever told me that. You look, read the story. She starts crying, backing up. I go, don't run away. Jesus loves you. And the more, oh, but you know what? I didn't get her saved, but I planted the seed. It's the love of Jesus that turns the world back to where it needs to be. And I'll close with this. I'm in Israel. I jump into a taxi. I'm in Jerusalem. And, you know, when you're in Jerusalem, you're not supposed to jump in a taxi that has an Arab driver. You're not supposed to. If you don't know where they're going to take you. I just jumped in, and I had an American flag pin on my suit. And the guy looks at me. Oh, American. I hate Americans. And this young guy, and I go, you hate me? I go, well, I love you. You cannot love me. You're American. Americans, we're taught that you guys hate us and this and this and that. I go, I'm so sorry. They lied to you. I said, I love you. Because you cannot love me. Yes, I can love you. And I started ministering to him about Jesus. When we got to the hotel, those type of taxis can't pull into the King David Hotel. So he parts a little bit further down, and the security is keeping looking at us. They have a Hispanic, and I'm 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 in I'm in in awe that this guy is telling me that he was taught as a little boy to hate me because of what we are. And he goes, and then and all of a sudden he starts to cry a little bit. And he goes, "Wait a minute, because it's English, bro. I got I got to translate it." He goes, "You're a beautiful man." And I believe you that you love me. All it is, what? Sharing the love of Jesus Christ. I was afraid also sitting in that car. Hey, it's normal. It was normal. Inside, I was praying in tongues. Showed out about why did I get in this taxi? But God knew I had an assignment with this young man. He will never forget that. I gave him my phone number. There's people that need Jesus, just like all of us in here. So, with your eyes closed. Maybe you're here today. You know, maybe God is saying, hey, uh, Some of y'all just need to come home. You tried everything. But it just could be that one little touch. No one's looking. If that is you, just wave at me. Wave your hand at me. Anybody. We'll wait, a couple, we'll wait a couple of seconds that you just need to make things right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, maybe you just need a fresh touch of the Lord to keep you going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm going to ask you to do a bold th- boldness. Can everybody stand up? Something bold. <laughs> I just heard in the spirit someone say, why did Pastor Pino ask, them and ask him to come and say this stuff? That's why. <laughs> if this message spoke to you and you need to, uh, me to pray a blessing over you, And you just need to make things like you need to get just where you need to be. I want you to come up here and line up up here in front. Let's come forward. Thanks for joining us and listening to this week's podcast. I want to give a special thanks to those who generously give to this ministry. It's because of your generosity that this ministry is made possible. If you would like to give, you can click the link in the show notes or go to overflowchurch.co slash give. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can subscribe and share this with your friends. And listen, if you're in the Las Vegas area, we would love to see you at one of our weekend services. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.